pleasure to introduce uh, Matthias Kurlan uh, today. Uh, he is coming uh, to us from the Copenhagen Business School, where apparently they do a lot of work on natural language processing. Uh, Matthias is known for uh, uh, building the Danish Dependency Tree Bank, and he also is working on the uh, Danish English uh, Dependency Parallel Tree Bank. Uh, he spent a little bit of time in the 90s at, uh, at UCAM, actually was in the math department there before he realized that uh, language was the right thing to be working on. Uh, and uh, uh, so he is currently the head of the computational linguistics group at, uh, at the Copenhagen Business School. And today he'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of a psycholinguistics talk, I guess, and, uh, and about his dependency uh, uh, formalism, known as the discontinuous grammar. So, without further ado, thank you. the aims and visions of the research that I want to present here today. Then I want to talk about the underlying dependency theory. The basic question I would like to address is how can we use dependency theory to account for full and partial syntactic analysis. Um, I'll try to, if time permits, to briefly mention how can we annotate text with minimal effort, which is important if we want to do supervised uh, uh, training of dependency models, then we'd need to create the annotated resources and in order to do that, um, we really need to create annotated resources in a cost-efficient way. Um, then I'll talk a little bit, a bit, li little bit about learning. How can we model dependency analysis generatively? I'll talk about parsing, if time permits. Again, how can we utilize local grammaticality to build an error-driven incremental parser? And I'll talk about what has been done to evaluate the proposal. proposal. And finally, I'll talk about what has been achieved and what remains. Um, first of all, I'd like to make some observations about linguistics and psycholinguistics. And the first is an observation from linguistics. Um, the notion of grammaticality has played a dominant role in linguistics since Chomsky made his uh, syntactic structures in 1957. And it has played a dominant role in rule-based NLP before the statistical paradigm. So this is the first observation. Second observation, the grammaticality plays almost no role in current statistical natural language processing. Um, Basically, what happened was that robustness and disambiguation were deemed more important. So, for that reason, grammaticality was basically dumped. Um, then the third observation is that humans seem to have conscious intuitions about grammaticality, and they're capable of pinpointing and explaining linguistic errors. So they know where the errors are if we make them. They can say that this is a case agreement error or this is uh, other kinds of errors. So it seems that since humans are capable of doing this, it must somehow be important for human language processing. So the question is, what role does grammaticality play in human language processing, and how can we model it from a probabilistic point of view? Um, did we miss an important point by not modeling on grammaticality in statistical NLP? This is one of the basic questions I'd like to address in this talk. Um, second observation is from eye tracking, a study by Frazier and Rayner, made in 1982, a classical one. Uh, when humans read garden path sentences, the eyes move forward until they reach the disambiguating reading region. So we have a garden path sentence, and we have a disambiguating re region where the humans uh, realize that something is wrong. Um, then the eyes move back to the problematic region. Uh, the hypothesis from the psycholinguist uh, is that some kind of repair is going on here. Uh, and then the error is somehow resolved, and the uh, uh, eyes uh, pr proceed uh, with what they were doing before. So the interpretation that Frasch and Rayner has is that humans somehow pursue a preferred analysis, and when it proves wrong, they can identify, locate, and revise the problematic parts of the analysis. So humans do some kind of error-driven processing. So the question is, are humans, uh, grammars, capable of identifying localized errors? And I think there's some reason to suggest that they are. Is human language processing error-driven? Again, if we look at uh, psycholinguistics and these eye-tracking experiments, it seems that uh, some kind of error-driven uh, processes are taking place. And then the third question, which is, of course, an open question, can we improve statistical NLP by using error-driven algorithms that seek to model human behavior? Um, so those were the two observations. 
So let me now talk a little bit about grammaticality. So basically, until now, grammaticality has been viewed as a global phenomenon. And the only reason we've been interested in grammaticality is in order to separate the grammatical sentences from the ungrammatical ones. Um, but we could also take a local view, which I think is more sensible, and say that grammaticality is really a local phenomenon. I mean, if you think about a very 80-word uh, sentence, does it make sense to say that this sentence is ungrammatical if it contains a slight error somewhere in the, uh, in, in the sentence? Or if you take an entire discourse, say, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses uh, with 800 pages of text, and it contains a, a single small error on page 799, does that mean that the entire uh, Ulysses uh, edition is ungrammatical? I don't think it really makes sense to talk about grammaticality as a, local f uh, as, as a global phenomenon. It is really a local phenomenon. And we want to use grammaticality to pinpoint grammatic grammatical errors. We're not really interested in sort of separating the ungrammatical sentences from the grammatical ones. We, are, we want to identify the errors in the ungrammatical sentences. That is what we really need grammaticality for. And if we identify the error, then we need to fix it somehow or see if we can fix it. So um, in the global view, a grammar, grammar is a grammaticality or perhaps a probability measure that assigns a number to every conceivable analysis A. So think of the huge base of conceivable analysis and uh, a, a, a sort of a classical rule-based Chomsky and grammar is simply a measure that assigns the value one if it's grammatical and zero if it's ungrammatical. Uh, or it could be a context-free, uh, probabilistic context-free grammar that assigns uh, a probability to the entire sentence. And um, uh, it could be both good and bad analysis. But you could also think of a grammar as a localized probability measure that assigns probabilities to analysis, but not just global probabilities. What they really do is that they are based on some kind of generative dependency model where the dependency analysis is generated by a lot of small decisions uh, uh, along the lines that uh, Jason Eisner has, has been doing and Michael Collins have been doing in dependency parsing. And for each of these steps, uh, generative steps at each node, we assign a local probability to each uh, step uh, in the generative model. And um, in the global uh, framework, uh, what can we say about errors? Well, we can only say, does an analysis contain an error? If so, we assign it probability or grammaticality zero. If it's... Um, if, if it doesn't contain any errors, then it receives a non-zero grammaticality value or probability value. But in the local view, we can do something which is much more interesting. We can say that we have an error at a particular node with respect to a certain generative step if uh, the probability associated with this generative step at this particular node falls below a certain threshold. Um, so if a local decision was very improbable, then that means that this local decision was ungrammatical. And this threshold might be determined by setting, for example, uh, it to the 99% quantile for the step S. You could maybe do something that would, would be more complicated by applying machine learning techniques. So you could see whether if you detect an error, you try to repair it. Is it really an error? Does it actually lead to a successful repair or doesn't it lead to a successful repair? If it does lead to a successful repair, you can lower the threshold. If it uh, doesn't lead to a successful repair, maybe you want to, um, sorry, sorry. If it, if it leads to an, a successful repair, you want to uh, basically raise the threshold. Um, if, if it doesn't, you want to lower it. So you become more restrictive about what is an error. <coughs> so this is a difference between a global view of grammaticality and a local view of grammaticality. So here's a vision about modeling human grammar that is inspired by these uh, observations and this notion of grammaticality. Um, so we would like to have a probabilistic grammar model that assigns these local probabilities to the generative steps at particular nodes. And this model must be capable of pinpointing the local errors in the graph in terms of local probabilities and these generation step dependent thresholds. So we basically want a probability model that can identify the errors in our analysis and say, hey, here's an error. Uh, maybe you should correct it or see if you could correct it. Um, we want to be able to model partial analysis. We know that human passing is incremental. We, can, we interpret things as we hear them. We don't wait until the end. Uh, you don't wait until the end of my sentence before you interpret it. So we need, know that we need to be able to model partial analysis in some way. 
and their temporal aspects. So uh, uh, I'll return to this in order to support incremental processing. Um, Will you define what a step is? Right, I mean, a step could be that you, you, uh, you basically have um, a Markov procedure where you uh, start, for example, with a top node, uh, and then you say, uh, I want to generate a root node for the entire sentence. Uh, so you generate the root node, you choose a lexeme, that's another step. Uh, then you choose a complement frame, that's another step. Then you generate the complements one by one. Each of that would be a step. You gen generate dependence and so on. You assign uh, some kind of word order structure to all these uh, different uh, generation steps. You could do uh, uh, anaphor resolution. That would be a particular step. You could select morphological inflections. So, I mean, I, so far I haven't specified what the step is. That's specified in the dependency model, but I mean you could envisage many different kinds of models and basically I think they should be as detailed as possible. So, so from your, uh, yeah, I, I hadn't understood this until you told Fred that the dependents were generated separately, uh, but the, in, in your view if you have a singular subject uh, and a plural verb, then one of them is generated first and it's generating the second one that's the grammatical error. Uh, right, so the web is generated first and the subject is then generated in the generative model because the, the model has to generate things in a top-down manner. Sure, and if you had uh, a, uh, uh, if your verb were to be uh, and you had a feminine subject uh, and a masculine adjective, um, then, right, then you, you just have to decide they're generated in some order and so one yes. of them is ungrammatical and it's, uh, exactly. it's kind of arbitrary. Yes, uh, good observation. The, you define a particular generation order where you rank the different complements. So basically you generate, uh, what, I mean, in the classical linguistics literature you were talked about heavy complements uh, and, and sort of more light complements. So you basically rank the different dependency roles and you generate the heavy ones first. After you've generated the complements, you generate the adjuncts again according to some, uh, some measure. So that's a basic idea. Um, Right. Um, so then the, the fourth desideratum is that uh, this dependency model should be learnable from annotated data. Uh, I mean, of course, you could wish for, for learning from unannotated beta data, but I'm not, I mean, it's, at this point, it's not clear that it can be done with a sophisticated linguistic model that really captures what linguists would think is a, a reasonable description of language. Um, so I'll assume that we have annotated data at, uh, combined with self-training where the parser can be applied to a larger corpus afterwards. So maybe starting with a 100,000 word tree bank or maybe larger if you have the money to do it and then applying it to a very big corpus where you can uh, learn uh, additional parameters. Um, and then of course the f f uh, fifth and also very important thing is that the, the processing model should or the computation of the grammar, uh, the computations made by the grammar when you assign probabilities to linguistic analysis and uh, the computations you do when you learn the grammar should be computationally feasible otherwise it's not really interesting. If we have, ha have a good algorithm with exponential com time complexity then it's completely use useless even though it will eventually produce the right result. Um, so the second vision is about modeling human language processing and um, here we would like to, to say that the parser should be incremental. That is, at every step, it must provide an anal analysis of the input that it has encountered so far. That's what humans do, and the basic intuition behind my work has been to, to model what humans do. I think this, is, this may be a shortcut to creating more efficient processing methods in the long run. At least it's an idea that's worth trying, and this is sort of the bet I've made in my research that something like this is possible. But of course, you d never know. Um, then the parser must be globally serial, uh, according to the idea proposed by um, um, uh, by the eye track tra tracking uh, experiments. So it must maintain a single preferred analysis at all times that is then repaired underway. So this is very different from what goes on in most uh, parsing approaches today, where you don't repair analysis destructively, but here you actually change your analysis destructively. Um, W during the parsing. Yeah, we don't actually know from the eye tracking experiments whether humans maintain a single analysis or if they have a beam. No, no, we don't know that. That's true. 
but but I mean a simple interpretation would be that if you have a beam then you should be able to do compositional semantics on all those parts in the beam and, and it's part I mean can you do that when you want to in integrate semantic and pragmatic constraints is it realistic or isn't it and I mean maybe it is it's an open question I think but if it could be done with a serial algorithm then that would be sort of nice because then you, you wouldn't have to worry about the parallel processing of many different semantic structures. Sure, th this is a reasonable architecture. Uh, Sorry? The architecture you're proposing is a reasonable machine architecture. Right. Th there are a lot of things that people could be doing, including maintaining a beam for a few words and then proving. Right. Uh, and, and I think, I, mean, I talked with Keith about this yesterday, and, and I think you could make a strong argument that humans are probably capable of maintaining at least a few different analysis at the time. For example, in poetry, you can have several, uh, it, it can be sort of deliberately ambiguous. And you know that it both has a, maybe a metaphoric meaning and a literal meaning, and both of them are really consciously available to you. And in that case, of course, you need to maintain a, a very small beam or whatever you'd call it in that case. But, but I think that basically it should be a very small one if it's compatible with human passing. Mm, this is a conjecture. Um, sorry. Um, uh, the, oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I just screw up. Oh, what is going on here? Sorry. Um, so the third desideratum for the processing is that, is that the parser should be locally parallel when searching for the best repair both so that it's compatible with the brain's parallel architecture. We know that the brain is perhaps, a, it's a brilliant parallel system. We, we know that from the architecture. And it would sort of be nice if we, can, if we could, we know that the uh, sort of, uh, I, I don't know, what, with the frequency with which the brain is operating is very slow. So somehow if you need to make a credible model of processing, then you would like to exploit this uh, parallel structure in the brain. So it would be nice if we could create the locally parallel uh, searches where we can exploit the brain's parallel architecture if we want to model human passing and also take advantage of uh, techniques in, in modern multi uh, processors uh, like uh, multi threading and so on. I think this is also an important uh, thing. So, this is basically a, a part of the algorithm that you can do local parallel searches when you're, you have this uh, analysis that you've created by analyze, analyzing the input so far. And you try to modify it in several different ways. You have an inventory of operations that can be used to modify the analysis. And you could do that in parallel. And then the processes could communicate and say, well, I found something that has an improvement of uh, five or whatever measure you're going to use. And another one says, I only have an improvement of one. So I give up my search. And uh, you can continue with the other ones. And finally, we'll compete the race and choose the best one. Um, the uh, fourth desideratum here is that the repair operations must be error driven. They must be guided by the local errors detected by the, by the grammar. So we created this probabilistic grammar that can detect local errors in the analysis. Uh, of course, the uh, processing architecture that we propose must be capable of exploiting these local, uh, this local error <coughs> detection. And then, of course, uh, it would be really nice if the parser has an almost linear time complexity, complexity so that it can handle discourse inputs without word segmentation, because that's what humans do. We analyze entire text uh, where we have long distance uh, and anaphor resolution and so on, and uh, we don't have any word segmentation when we do the processing. It, the, the input doesn't come chunked up into words. So maybe it would be nice if the parser could do this kind of processing as well, and that could be incorporated into the model. And in fact, uh, the architecture that I'm going to propose has a worst case time complexity, which is uh, linear times a logarithmic factor. So you can show theoretically that it does have this nice, almost linear time complexity property. But then, of course, there's a last prob uh, pro property that it must mimic human behavior. That is, it should succeed and fail like humans do, both with respect to garden paths, where we know that human passing sometimes fails, and with respect to precision and recall. I mean, if I'm capable of analyzing some structure, uh, then the model should uh, ideally come up with the same answer, of course. Um, so those are the desiderata. And of course, the big question here is that 
like with Joachim Niebuhr's parsing algorithm, he has designed a parsing algorithm that is guaranteed to have nice computational properties. But the big question with this algorithm was, did it actually produce the right results? And it's the same thing with my algorithm. The time complexity is guaranteed. The open question is, do we actually get a nice precision and recall with this uh, parsing architecture? Um, so the final uh, question I would like to answer in, uh, in this uh, motivation of my approach is, uh, why dependency grammar? Why not use some other kind of framework like uh, government and binding theory, HPSG, LFG, tree adjoining grammar, um, whatever. And, and why is that? I think, um, first of all, I'd like to say that a dependency theory can be as linguistically sophisticated as any other theory like HPSG and LFG. Um, so, so, I mean, you can, if you design your dependency models right, you can, you can capture the same intuitions within a dependency framework that you can capture within these uh, sophisticated linguistic formalisms. Um, but it has the advantage that there's less hidden structure when you do parsing, because you know all the nodes in advance. There's, there are no non-lexical nodes, so you don't have to try to guess what the nodes are, what the phrasal nodes are. You, the only unknown th uh, pr uh, structure are, is the edges that you have in the structure. They are unknown. But it sort of reduces the problem of knowing the nodes and uh, just uh, having the edges as the unknown. You, you do allow empty lexical nodes, though, is that right? I do allow empty lexical nodes, that's true, but they're lexically driven. So, so what they... Was the word? What, what lexical nodes? Empty. Empty. What she translates? No. Like empty. No. Huh? Empty. 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 I see, right? Right. All right. <laughs> no, empty. You right. allow them, but you said they're lexically driven? Yes, the lexically licensed, so, so you can only introduce empty nodes when a, a certain lexical item says that in this context I should generate an empty... But of course uh, that's uh, analogous to these, em these hidden nodes in structural based theories if you have a lexicalized grammar. Right. So, yes. so those are also lexically driven. Right, yes, absolutely. So, so the main point here is that it's lexically driven and you don't really predict any structure that is not lexically licensed, like you would do in a phrase structure grammar where you could uh, build very high structures and you wouldn't really know where to start. So it's, it's a, the, the use of phonetically empty notes uh, is, is really very restricted. That's a, the main point. You cannot avoid it altogether if you want to account for certain linguistic phenomena, but you can restrict it as much as, as possible. And that's what I've tried to do. Um, and the third thing is that dependency representation leads to smaller edit distances between alternative analysis of ambiguities measured with respect to the number of node and edge changes. And this uh, simplifies the, the repair operations that are needed for the processing architecture that, that I'm going to propose. Yeah, I think that's really the key point. Yeah, that's a key point. So people, people who are trying to do these things with phrase structural grammars a number of years ago had to use D-tree representations and stuff like that. Or right, right. Yeah. And I, I'll show the... Uh, example here that will demonstrate what the difference is. We have two phrase structure analysis here. We have one on the left, which is uh, with, with a classical PP attachment where the PP attaches to the NP. And then we have another one where the PP attaches to the VP. And if you think about what is the edit d distance, if you sort of just apply editing operations to the graph structure viewed as a graph, then you would have to de delete four edges in the first graph and sort of change the node, the NP node here. And then you'd have to add uh, three other, four other edges in the other graph and modify the VP node, giving a total edit distance of 10. But if you look at the corresponding dependency representation down here, uh, you see that all you need to do is, I mean, the nodes are given because they are generated by the, lex by, by the input. So all you need to do is to change this dependency, which attaches to Y and then let it attach to saw it instead. So you need to delete one arc and then add another arc, giving it edit distance of two, and that makes it a lot more convenient for doing repair operations than, than a phrase structure-based framework. Um, so in this talk, I'll try to focus on the dependency theory and demonstrate a toy system that will give you an idea of how the parsing algorithm works within this framework. I'll try to, to to communicate the main ideas about the parsing approach and the learning and so on. I don't know whether I'll do everything. I probably won't, but I'll try to give the main ideas. Can we go back to that example for just a second? Oh, it's yeah. interesting that people who've talked about these sorts of examples have argued that there's an asymmetry between <coughs> that, that um, 
that repair, namely that it's, at least some people have suggested that it's easier to go from the right hand structures to the left hand structures in than it is to go the other way. In human passing or? Yeah, that there's a sort of preference for lowering rather than raising, if you like. Right. Um, that the PP gets lowered inside the noun phrase. And if you just assess that as a measure of edit distance, there's no, there's no sense of that. Right. I mean, I mean, edit distance is a very crude measure, and I think it, it's important for the processing. I think in the language model, you would probably like to say something like, uh, if you attach to, to a, a, a head nearby, that's better than attaching to a head which is very far away. I mean, if I imagine an 80-word sentence, uh, if, if you just attach a word, a, a, a word to its uh, previous node as a dependent, you'll get something like 60% uh, recall and precision on just by doing this uh, stupid procedure. So, I mean, what it really says is that these dependencies are very local and usually they're between neighboring words. So you should build in some preference for doing local attachments measured in, in the word distance between these yeah, two. And, and with respect to Bob's question, I think uh, since, since you're using probabilities in your uh, of repair operations, mm. uh, you're effectively using a weighted edit distance, I, I would guess. So you could say that uh, uh, deleting a local dependency uh, is less probable or more costly uh, than deleting a lower dependency. Mm. So that would explain the asymmetry that you're talking about. You just don't want to correct things that are nice and local because you assume that they're right. <clears throat> right. So uh, let me talk a little bit about dependency theory, which is the topic that Keith really wanted me to talk most about today. And it has a century-long history in European grammar and lexicography, uh, and it comes in many versions. Uh, there's a classical dependency theory by Tenier and Helbig. Uh, there's a functional generative description by uh, Scal and colleagues. There's a word grammar by Hudson. I've created my own dependency framework called Discontinuous Grammar, which is uh, specifically designed for this kind of processing, in, uh, with this kind of processing in mind. And then there are many other uh, dependency frameworks. So the important point here is that we cannot talk about dependency theory as one linguistic theory. It's, it's really a family of different linguistic theories that sometimes have things in common, but often also differ in important points. Uh, uh, so some th theories take a primarily semantic view, for example, the functional generative description, whereas others are more closely grounded in surface syntax, like word grammar and my own formalism. Um, starting with Eisner and uh, Collins, the dependency framework has become very influential in computational linguistics, first in probabilistic parsing and now increasingly in other areas, uh, such as machine translation, um, information retrieval, and so on. And the main attractions of the dependency representations within com from a computational linguistic uh, viewpoint is, first of all, the simplicity. All the nodes in the graph are lexical. There are no phrasal nodes, which often leads to more efficient computation. Uh, there's a great amount of locality. The linguistically related words are very close to each other in the graph structure. There are no intervening phrasal nodes. And this leads to simpler probability mo models. You don't have to transport the uh, words across uh, the phrasal nodes. And uh, there's also some degree of universality, since almost all linguistic theories have some kind of dependency backbone if them, in them if you look for it. It's quite easy to compute a dependency structure for HPSG, LFG, GB, triadionic grammar, categorical and s grammar, and so on. And this means that, they have s that, that the dependency representation can be viewed as a um, common denominator for all these linguistic frameworks of course, with some information laws, but at least this is something they have in common. And the reason that these frameworks differ a lot is basically the way they handle surface structure. This is what really makes them different from each other. So um, all, all dependency theories, they assume that grammatical relations can be expressed as relations between pairs of words. So syntax graphs, they consist of word nodes and label directed edges that go from a head word to a subordinate word. And dependency graphs can be visualized in many different ways. So here's one. Uh, this is the one I'm using in my, within my framework where we have, if we want to encode that uh, the phrase headed by X is the subject of the verb so, we simply draw uh, an arc from so to the word X, uh, the head word X, indicating that it's subject, it is a subject by, uh, by means of this label. 
Similarly, we indicate that Y uh, is, is a direct object of SOAR by making this dependency and then uh, writing the direct object label. And we can uh, annotate that um, with set is a modifier of SOAR by making a dependency where with is, uh, is analyzed as a head of this uh, adverbial phrase. But you could analyze, um, you could use a more classical dependency representation. The first dependency rep representation on the left is used in my theory and also in word grammar by Richard Hudson. Uh, you could also use a more classical dependency theory that is closer to uh, what Tenier is using and also what they're using in the functional generative description where you write the dependency annotation as a tree where you have words as a nodes and then linked by edges. Then you could label them, you could assign um, word uh, part of speech information to this uh, uh, graph. And finally you could transform it into a phrase structure graph as well where you have the Basically, every time you have a single node in the dependency graph, you just create two nodes in the phrase structure graph, a phrasal node and then the word uh, on the bottom. But they're really the same, and if you sort of squeeze the two together, you'd get the re dependency representation. And then you could indicate the uh, dependency labels on the edges here. And, um, and um, the main difference is between the, the, the normal phrase structure representation or, and, and and uh, this dependency representation is that in this phrase structure representation derived from the dependencies, every phrase has to have a lexical head. So you cannot have phrases that don't have a lexical head like the S node, which uh, if you both have an S node and a VP node, then the VP node has a verb as its lexical head, but there's really no lexical head available for the S node. So that's not allowed in a dependency theory. That's why we don't have an S node here, but only a VP node. The second difference is, is that uh, the dependencies can be non-protective, so you could have crossing branches in this tree, which is not normally allowed in most phrase structure grammars, but there are discontinuous phrase structure grammars that do allow it. So uh, dependency representation would be equivalent to these uh, discontinuous phrase structure grammars with a, um, uh, the restriction that every phrasal node has to have a lexical head. head. Um, we use, in discontinuous grammar, we use a left visualization, which is better for annotation work because it's basically a one-dimensional uh, 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 graphical representation. If, if you have a sentence with 80 words, it's going to be approximately linear. But if you use the other ones, it's going to expand in both dimensions, which is not nice when you look at the screen. <coughs> so complements and adjuncts. Sort of the bread and butter of linguistics is to have uh, complement and adjunct relations. So a dependency tree encodes complement and adjunct relationships. Here's an example. We have um, the dependency structure here, where we have the dependencies. We have, uh, for example, a subject dependency that goes here between it and was. We have a dependent. That's what is at the end of the arrow, uh, the dependency arrow. And we have a governor, which is at the other, uh, the, the outgoing end of the arrow. Um, and then we can define a notion of phrases within this framework by saying that if you pick a word, in the dependency analysis, you can find the phrase that it corresponds to by following the arrows downwards. So if we pick this word, the, the head of the phrase here, um, then we can construct the phrase and now something is, has gone wrong in the presentation. There should be an indication that the phrase corresponds here to a hard plan to implement. Those are all the words you can reach by starting at this node and then following the arrows down the dependency structure and seeing all the words you can reach. In that way you can derive a notion of phrases from the dependency structure. Then you can have lots of different dependency labels. Some of them are, are known to be complement or reserved to be complement relations. Others are reserved to be uh, adjunct relations and they encode things like direct and indirect objects, subjects, uh, adjuncts, uh, and so on. Um, like in other syntax theories, the deep tree is needed for compositional semantic interpretation. So the governor determines the syntactic type of the combined phrase and acts as a functor. The complement is lexically selected by the governor and acts as an argument. And the adjunct selects its governor lexically but acts as a modifier to the, uh, to the governor. So it's basically uh, a functor to the governor. So we can translate deep trees, the dependency trees, into functor argument trees. Um, and if we don't have any scope restrictions, the translation is going to be ambiguous uh, as follows. So we have a deep tree down here with a governor. 
and we have a number of complements and adjuncts. And then the complements are going to be the arguments of the gover governor, which is a functor. And then we apply the adjuncts as modifiers to the governor. And so since we didn't specify the scope, we could do it either by applying adjunct number one first and then adjunct number two, or the other way around. So by making scope restrictions, you can limit uh, the possible functor argument trees you can construct. So that was in relation to, to semantics. So um, dependency grammar, you could have complement rules like this, saying that the, the word saw is a verb, and it takes a subject. I'm doing it in a rule-based paradigm to make the presentation easier to understand. Uh, you could have a subject, which should be a noun, and a direct object, which should be a noun. The word with is a preposition, which takes a complement, uh, a nominal object, which must be a noun. Then we ha have x, which is a noun and doesn't take any complements. Y is a noun that doesn't take any complements, and so on with set. Then we could have adjunct rules saying that with is a preposition, and this preposition can attach itself as a modifier to any verb, but it could also attach itself as a modifier to a noun instead if we wanted to do that. Of course, this is not what a probabilistic grammar would look like. Here we would replace all the uh, labels we have here, the, the part of speech labels with the uh, random variables that stand for part of speech labels and possibly even words. And then would we, we would create a probability distribution over all those different possibilities. But let's forget about that right now. So dependency analysis, you could have an analysis here which would be licensed because we have for the verb saw, for example, we have a subject and a direct object. And this is licensed by the rule on the left here. Uh, and we have, uh, for example, the the uh, adverbial that attaches to saw is licensed by the red rule down here which says that a preposition like with can attach to um, a ver any verb as a modifier. And here's another analysis that would be licensed by this grammar. Uh, one problem with this grammar, I mean we could say we are all said and done, we don't need to do anything more. The problem is that our, our rules here don't say anything about word order. These rules are really unordered and they don't say anything about projectivity. It could be completely non-projective structures. They could be, be ordered any way you want. So basically, any permutation of these uh, two graphs here would be allowed as a, a dependency structure according to these rules. So if you, if you want to account for word order phenomena, we need to do something more sophisticated in order to control the word order. So the idea is that the dependency structure controls the compositional semantics and provides the interface to the compositional semantics but we also need a surface structure that controls word order. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk about now. So here we have a dependency tree. The, it was a hard plan to implement, where you can uh, argue that hard to implement is really a phrase where to implement has been extracted out of hard. The way, reason why you would think that this is a constituent is you could say the plan was hard to implement. And here, hard to implement would form a constituent. So that is an indication that this is really a constituent, but some extraction has taken place. Now we have a problem here that at this point, we have crossing arcs. And if we have a structure with crossing arcs, we cannot control word, word order, because uh, at least using local use, rules, the great thing about context-free grammar is that you can control the word order by controlling the head, the, the basically the, the, basically the fra phrasal nodes in the local rule you have the local tree you have. By controlling this word order all the way over the tree, you control the global word order. But if you have non-projectivity, that is completely impossible. You don't know how the things are going to intermix, and it's just going to be a hopeless mess. So for that reason, we have to do what is basically done in HPSG and LFG and uh, even GB to construct a surface tree or some kind of surface structure that, can, uh, that is projective and controls the word order. Um, and we do that by means of a lifting operation that says that whenever you have a crossing arc here, um, you try to find a node that, um, you, you look at the, you find, try to look, try to look for a transitive governor that dominates all words between the dependent and uh, the transitive governor. So for example, if we make this test for uh, two and its governor heart, we look at the nodes in between and we can ask, is plan dominated by the word heart? In the, in the dependency structure. Yes? Why isn't it applied to implement? Um, I mean, it's, it has a different meaning. It's basically ambiguous uh, because, I mean, if you say plan to implement, 
uh, you say uh, it's it's a plan with the purpose of implementing it. That's a basic reading you get out of the. Right, so, so hard to implement has a different reading than, than the plan to implement. This is a plan you are, which you are supposed to implement. You could paraphrase it as a relative clause. But hard to implement um, is a hard to implement plan. Yeah, the, the plan yeah. is hard to implement. It's difficult to implement it. That's a basic reading. So it's the implementation that is hard. That's a basic thing you want. This can't be paraphrased by the plan to implement was hard. That's a different thing. No, but a different plan may not be hard. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you guys are native speakers, but yeah, there, there's some scope ambiguity. Right. Which it, it, is a lot of or something. It is an ambiguous construction, and you could get the reading you were uh, talking about. That is certainly a possibility. But this one is also a legal reading. Um, so you do have, do have both readings, yeah. Um, but in this case, if you say a hard plan to implement, probably most, well, I don't know. It, it might be, yeah. But that's not the main point. Let's just assume that we have this dependency analysis and we want to do the lifting. Um, so we basically do this by saying plan is not, um, heart does not dominate all the nodes between uh, heart and two because it doesn't dominate plan. So we go to the next higher level in the dependency structure. So we move from heart up through the arrow here down to A. And now we can ask, does A dominate all the words between A here and two, um, and the answer here is yes, because it dominates hard by means of this edge, and it dominates plan uh, by means of this edge. And for that reason, we can lift it here, and you can prove, uh, make a proof that if you follow this procedure, you always get uh, a, a protective structure afterwards, and you couldn't, it's a minimal structure in the sense that you couldn't lift things any lower and still get a projective yeah, structure. Sorry to disturb you here. Uh, what are lifting? It, it just means that, that instead of um, having the dependency between two and hard, you create sort of, a, uh, you, you transform the dependency. Basically, it's the same idea as, as moving in uh, GB, that you have a certain surface realization here in the deep structure where two is really located at hard, and then you want to move it up in the structure in order to find a landing site that is projectively related to the this one. So. So the idea is that you go up from heart, which, which isn't a suitable uh, projective uh, head for the two word, and you go up in the structure, and that is where the lifting takes place, that you really lift up something. You lift up the dependency to a higher level in order to, uh, you, you replace the deep dependency with a surface dependency in order to arrive at a projective structure. And this is what is taking place in this lifting. And you always lift parents, never children. Uh, so, sorry, I always. You, you, whether, when you're crossing arms, right. um, you always take uh, the parent that's trapped under, uh, and you change the parent. You never change the child end of the arc, uh, because every child needs No, no, yes, exactly. Yeah. I only change the parent by going up to a transitive, uh, transitive parent. Right, exactly. So parents in this surface tree are called landing sites, and the children are called landed nodes. And now we have a projective structure that we can use to control word order uh, where the landed nodes must be licensed by the landing edges. So here's an example. We have this landing site heart, oh, sorry, A, and it has a number of landed nodes, which can be seen from the structure, surface structure on the bottom, where heart lands on this uh, word on this landing site, plan lands and two lands, and by looking at the relative word order of these landed nodes, we can determine whether it's a good word order or whether it's a bad word order. And we can uh, apply machine learning methods to do that. So here's uh, how I do it. Uh, for example, if we have this word order, hard a plan to implement, we all agree this is ungrammatical, uh, then we can look at the land, landed node structure and see that what is really wrong about this analysis is that the landed node hard precedes the determiner. You can find a few construction where it's possible to place something in front of the determiner, but normally it's not allowed. It's, it's very specific constructions. So in general, this is a very bad thing to do, and the statistical models should be able to see that this, this never happens, that we place a, a modifying adjective uh, in the front of the determiner. For that reason, this word ordering is completely out and ungrammatical bad. Whereas the other one here is good, because now we have the right kind of word order, that all the landed nodes uh, come after the determiner, uh, and with the right kind of ordering in terms of the 
uh, dependency roles that are up here. We have a modifier, then we have a nominal object, uh, and then we have uh, an extracted prepositional object. So knowing this kind of information is enough information to determine whether the word order is good or bad. Um, so um, now I would like to talk a little bit about the extraction path. Um, you can define an extraction path here where you have an extracted note like Alice. Here's, here the idea is it's a Danish sentence. Alice heard I the poem which always pleases. This is okay in Danish. I heard the poem which always pleases Alice. And here Alice has been topicalized. Um, and you have a governor here. And um, what, you, what you do here is you want to look at the, well, you have the governor here. You have the landing site over here. And you can look at the extraction path. Now it doesn't show up correctly here. Um, but the extraction path uh, is something you find by starting from the governor and then taking an upwards path in the deep structure going to the landing site. So those two nodes would be the extraction path, the, the, the arc connecting the poem with pieces and the other arc connecting hurt with the poem. Uh, and those are the uh, extraction path. And by looking at this extraction path, you can see that it contains an adjunct edge, namely this uh, relative... Uh, 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 relative clause, which is an adjunct edge, and this is bad. So by looking at the uh, edges that occur in the, the extraction path, you can recover the surface structure. And I think, um, well, my, maybe I'm, how, how much time do I have? Um, ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay, great. So, um, so um, what's some... I mean, maybe I should just go quickly through the rest of the talk and just say that sometimes we have uh, more than one dependency for each word. For example, if we have he has seen it, we have more than, basically we have two verbs, has and seen, and both of them require a subject, but there's only one subject in the sentence. So we need to account for this in some way, and we can do that by creating these fillers that Jason mentioned uh, in the beginning of the talk, which are licensed by this word. And that's, account, that's an account of that in my theory, of, of how we do that and how you can control this uh, construction. Uh, so here we have a filler. We have a filler licensor which generates a filler. So basically the story is that when you have a, a verb like has here, it says uh, I have a subject, I have a verbal object, I should generate a copy of the subject and pass it on to my verbal uh, I should generate a copy of the subject and pass it on to my verbal object. That's the story here. Um, and the same happens in, in relative clauses. The relative verb says, um, I, when I attach as a relative clause to something, I should uh, create a copy of the relative device noun, and then it should be consumed somewhere within the relative clause. In this case, the word is going to consume it itself. So you can do lots of interesting things here, uh, do sort of long chains of these things, of these secondary dependencies. Um, you can... Um, you can account for uh, coordinations uh, where you have uh, ellipses. Basically, you share dependence at the periphery. He is shared by spotted, <coughs> aimed at, and shot. And the elephant is also shared by all these, these three words, and you need to account for that. Uh, you can do, uh, um, do um, parasitic gaps, and you can do... Um, uh, even gapping coordinations where you elide the head in the, uh, con in the uh, second conjunct. That can also be dealt with in this framework. Um, so you can also account for punctuation in this framework. The basic idea, oh, I didn't include an example, but uh, the basic idea is that you attach punctuation marks as adjuncts. And punctuation marks are really interesting because they are really context sensitive. So for example, if you have Normally, you'd like to say, if, if I have a clause like, uh, if I'm going to the cinema, comma, um, you'd like to say there's a comma after every if clause of that kind. But if you have uh, the if clause at the end of the sentence uh, and say, um, I want uh, to, I'll be happy if I go to the cinema, then you don't have the comma because, comma because you have the period at the end of the sentence. So this uh, generation decision of whether to omit a comma or not is really context sensitive and depends on the punctuation that has been placed higher in the dependency tree. And you can model this kind of stuff also by means of uh, this framework. You can model the speech repairs where you have a, a referendum, something that you want to repair, 
from Boston here, this is a reparandum indicated with this rep dependency. Uh, you have uh, an editing phrase here, and then you have uh, some repair dependence that replace the, the material that is in the reparandum. And this is uh, useful, of course, for modeling this kind of phenomena. Uh, you could analyze discourse structures as sort of extended dependency structures, where you also have anaphoric relations with antecedents. Um, you could analyze morphology in this way also, where you uh, think of morph morphemes, at least some of them, as, um, as uh, independent lexemes that are combined together by means of complement and attring that, uh, mechanisms, but also by means of uh, lexical transformations that are responsible for suffixes and inflections and that kind of stuff. Um, so now I'll just move ahead. Um, yeah. um, it's also important to account for partial analysis for incremental processing, uh, where you basically get structures like this when you do incremental processing. He said that today he, now we don't know what is coming after here, so we attach these two words temporarily to a part of the structure, and then we need to account for these kinds of partial analysis uh, during passing, and our probability model must be capable of assigning probabilities to these models. If it assigns zero probability, we would be in trouble when we do the incremental processing. So we need to do something like this, and you can ask about what is the resolution time for if you're waiting for a governor, for example, how long are you going to wait in the input measured in seconds uh, if it's a speech signal or in uh, characters if it's a written signal, how long are you going to wait uh, before you, the problem is resolved. You can limit that kind of thing with a statistical distribution, add it in, and you get um, some interesting behavior here. If you say that you model the, the time frame here, that uh, after at time t2, I would expect with a probability of uh, this one minus q, that the problem has been resolved at this point. Now you can do something that if you want to look at the expected gain, the probability that you can resolve the problem times the gain you get by doing the probability, you can c calculate the expected gain, but when if you try to do a repair operation at this threshold tau and you're unsuccessful, you gain some information because you know that uh, you won't uh, it wasn't resolved at, until this point. So basically the probability, the conditional probability given the repair you made uh, drops down to zero and then it goes up again. So this basically means that the parser will maybe wait in the beginning, beginning before it tries to attempt a, a repair. And if it, if it has attempted a repair, it will wait a little while before it tries again because it just attempted one unsuccessfully, so there's no reason trying again. And eventually it may give up making the repair if it's never resolved. So this is an interesting behavior to have in an incremental grammar. Um, right, I'll skip this annotation thing. Um, there's this point about the generative model. Um, and I would like to sort of outline the generative procedure which starts from a formal root node top, then you generate the first root adjunct for top. This is a very simplified model. You generate the first root adjunct, you generate the complement frame for it, so you could generate a subject and a direct object. Then you generate, you instantiate the subject first with the word n, Gen instantiate the direct object, generate a complement frame for it, then you instantiate the, the complement of the nominal object here with the word piano, and then finally, you maybe create some modifiers to, to the nodes here. And the real, um, sorry, uh, there's a problem with that. Oh, sorry, I'll have to show it in this one. Um, I don't know why it doesn't work. So the, the basic generation procedure is a lot more complicated than the one I sh sh showed to you before. It's primarily, we have to do a lot of a primary top-down expansion with a lot of different steps where we identify landing site and relative word order, then we generate and expand complements and simple fillers using the same techniques that uh, Eisner and Collins did. Uh, then we generate and expand the non-punctuation adjuncts. Again, this is basically the same technique as in Collins. Um, then we generate and expand gapping conjuncts. This is really new in the model. Uh, we have a secondary top-down expansion where we generate and expand deep roots. We identify antecedents. We generate punctuation marks. 
and we do top-down expansions of all the subnodes. So the main point here is you don't have to understand all the details. It's just that we can create a very fine-grained generative model of all the steps that are uh, taking place here um, and, and uh, to try to estimate the probabilities for all the decisions that are made here. Um, so I'll, I'll talk briefly about the parsing algorithm simply by showing you an example. We have uh, a, a simple grammar here that says that if you don't have a governor, you uh, get a fine of $5. If you don't have a landing site, you get a fine of $5. If you have bad case agreement, you get a $5 fine. If you have better complement frames, you get a $5 frame. And if you have an inverted sentence, you maybe get uh, a 0 0.5 fine, uh, 50 cent fine. So if the cost is bigger than $1, then it's analyzed as an error. If it's smaller than $1, it's, there's no error, it's just a preference. So then you can uh, sort of do the parsing. You first read the first word, and it's an error node because it has got any governor or landing site. You read the next word. It doesn't have any governor and landing site. So what you do is you just apply greedily some repair operations to the structure. So you find out that, hey, you could analyze this as a subject. John is the subject of belief, and it lands on belief. So now John is happy. It does have a governor landing site, but uh, believe still doesn't have a governor landing site. And you can look at the total cost here. So the different repair uh, alternatives uh, create different total costs, and you choose the optimal one. You can then read the next word, John believe I, with the nominative case. This is a Danish example. So here the problem is that normally you'd expect John to be the subject, but now the real subject arrives and it has nominative case marking, so it's unambiguously the subject and the other one is the direct object. So you can say, I believe John, where John has been topicalized. So it complains about not having a governor and landing site, um, but now we, we simply attach I as a subject of belief because it says, I'm, hey, I'm as good a subject uh, of belief as John is, so I'll just attach as a subject, sort of squeeze myself in and now there are two subjects competing for the subject position. So we get a bad C-frame violation here where both uh, verbs here, of both subjects have a bad C-frame cost. And you can then reanalyze John as a direct object. So you try to repair the error by reanalyzing uh, the John dependency as a direct object. But uh, the deals are not over net yet because um, now we get uh, a new word, we, which is also nominative marked, doesn't have a governor and landing site. Um, and we can analyze it as a temporarily landed node. So we cannot really make a reasonable dependency analysis of this structure. I mean, we have too many complements and too few complement frame positions. So it's just, have to, it's just parked at this position. Uh, but we did give it a landing site, so it doesn't complain about not having a landing site, only not having a governor. So we go on and read the next word, meet. And now we can begin to do something. We can say that meet should attach as a verbal object of belief. But now we have both a direct object and a verbal object of belief, which again leads to a bad complement frame. We fix the error by reanalysis. So John is analyzed, reanalyzed as a direct object of meet. And then um, uh, we can reanalyze we as a subject of meet. Now we get down to having uh, only a problem with the uh, root of the sentence, which you would always get. You could introduce a formal top node into the graph and then this problem would disappear. I just didn't include it for simplicity. So basically you get an error-free analysis in this way by, by creating an a error-driven parser that does make mistakes on its way through the incremental processing, but it's capable of repairing these uh, errors. So evaluation, I've implemented this framework on a small scale, scale using Prolog with a, a toy grammar. And the, I've tested that the method works with a wide range of non-projective word orders in German, like topicalizations, partial verb phrases, extrapositions, scramblings, extracted conjuncts, sentences with local ambiguities and global ambiguities, and garden paths. And interestingly, the algorithm fails on garden paths, but works on the rest. And the next step is a large-scale implementation of the parsing system, and I'm seeking to do this jointly with Keith Holt, John Hill, and other people. Um, so the important points from this talk, I've de presented a new dependency framework that is based on a dependency theory that can account for a wide range of linguistic phenomena, including non-projectivity, secondary dependencies, and partial analysis and in incremental processing. 
I've uh, introduced a probabilistic generative dependency grammar that is capable of pinpointing local errors. And I've created, a, a, proposed a globally serial but locally parallel parsing algorithm with error-driven repair operations. And I skipped this slide, but it has worst case time complexity and times a log 3k plus 1n, where k is the number of, um, uh, of subsequent um, uh, passing operations it can, uh, can, uh, can make in the sequence of error-driven passing operations. But this is a worst case estimate, and probably in, in, uh, in a realistic setting, you wouldn't have to multiply with this big logarithmic factor. It could be even faster. But uh, that's an open question. At least it's not worse than this. And I've written under realistic linguistic assumptions. You have to make assumptions about uh, the balancedness of the graph. You don't want the graph to either every node be attached to the top node or every node being attached to the previous node so you get a long linear sequence that's sort of out. Uh, that's linguistically reasonable to assume that doesn't happen. And you have to assume some kind of island constraints that will ensure that you don't can, uh, cannot extract from arbitrary paths in the tree. If you can do that, there's no limit to the number of extractions, but there's a limit to the number of different really long distance extraction paths you could have. If you do that, you can get this uh, uh, time complexity. So what are the prospects for language technology if this uh, processing model works? So it, like I said, it remains to be tested on a large scale, but um, the good thing about it is that it really decouples the probability model from the processing model. You, can, you have very free hands in terms of the probability model that you apply, and the processing model is going to work anyway. Um, so there's no need for the restrictive independence assumptions that you need in minimal spanning tree passing or, and chart passing. And you can even implement some kind of n-grams, uh, n-gram model in the generative model. It's only, uh, the only problem is that, or problem, the only thing is that you can only condition on the words, the n-gram words that were generated previously in the generation order and not the ones that come afterwards because it's a generative model. Um, the decoupling makes it easy to extend the architecture to other problem domains like synchronous passing or machine translation. What do you do? You simply adjust the generative probability model to uh, account for these kinds of analysis and then you expand the inventory <coughs> through pair operations and then the same algorithm should work uh, again. And then the algorithm, because of its time complexity, it can in theory pass discourse-sized units without word segmentation and do it incrementally in almost linear time. Uh, and that should make it useful for speech processing and uh, discourse passing if you can couple it with some kind of pragmatic semantic model. So those were the basic points of my talk and I, I thank you for your attention. Just right, yes? Quickly, at the beginning of the talk you were mentioning trying to identify specific local errors. Right. So that's you're integrating in just the error-driven algorithm, or are you actually trying to, in your work with your parsing, um, identify like a grammar checker for um, where errors might occur, say, in spontaneous speech? I mean, basically, you could use, I mean, the ideal would be that the probabilistic model would be good enough to be used as a grammar checker so that it could say, at this point, you have a grammatical error. Uh, and maybe, um, if you coupled it with some kinds of transformations, maybe, uh, you could, again, using a, an error-driven architecture, maybe fix the error by reordering things, or um, I don't know. I mean, you could imagine that you could use it for grammar checking and uh, proposing better things, but at least for grammar checking. I mean, the ideal should be that the probability model should really tell us what are the linguistic problems in this analysis and where are the errors. This is basically, basically the problem. Okay. Thanks. So, so I think this is a very tasteful approach on many levels. I was surprised um, when you said that the at least the toy system fails on garden path sentences, because I would have thought that uh, those were the cases where you would expect it to backtrack and fix things up. Is it because it can't backtrack far enough? Well, the, the, it doesn't really backtrack. It, it tries to repair the structure, and when you do the garden path sentence, you, you've attached the... Um, so the I, I don't mean backtrack. I mean, so I mean repair. Repair. So, so the basic idea is that, I mean, that the simplest kind of repair operation you could think of would be to change k arbitrary dependencies, right? I mean, you could simply say, I do a repair operation by 
deleting k dependencies and then adding k arbitrary dependencies. But that doesn't, really, I mean, that's very costly because basically you could, you would have enter the case when, whenever you did that or something that was even worse than that. Um, so you would get a very huge search base and it would be very inefficient. And I think the main point in noticing is that if you have a very big sentence, I mean, 80 words, for example, and you have a problem here and you want to correct this problem, it would be very odd to try to make some change here and then go far away in the structure and then make some other change and then hope that magically those two very unrelated parts of the structure by making an edit operation that you would somehow fix the problems that you created over there. So, so the, the basic idea is to restrict it so that you only look at very closely related words in the graph. They are the most sort of local, the domain you're considering. That brings down the dependence of the, the, um, uh, the, the time complexity that you need because you restrict really the uh, possibilities for repair operations. And then if you can restrict it even further, if you say that every, every you have some elementary uh, repair operations that can change structure, like deleting one dependency, adding another, and so on. Um, and then you say that every one of these elementary uh, repair operations, the first ones should correct an identified error in the graph at a particular error node. Then the second one should uh, uh, correct an error made by the first repair operation, and so on. Then you can link them together and, and and, and sort of restrict the kinds of operations that can be made. And this is what really gives you the ability to get this nice time complexity, theoretical time complexity. Okay. Yes, David? Maybe to save the phenomena, what you should say is that the correct thing to do for a that sentence is to fail and then restart with right. some different adjustment. Uh, yeah, that, your that, right. so that might be right, although I don't know whether people would back up to the beginning of Ulysses and start again. I mean, I mean, one 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 way you no, could. It would be good to figure out how far you I mean, one way you could account right, for this. You could have more drastic kinds of repair that involved throwing right. out. Right. Well, you, you, you could change the whole You could. Uh, you could. And, I mean, you could add something like backtracking if you wanted. And one way to do it would be to um, change your probability model when you go through the second time. I don't think that would really be needed. I think the basic idea that David proposed is maybe right. I mean, you could imagine, I mean, if you have this k error passing where you allow k errors to be corrected, maybe the sensible thing to do would be to start with one error uh, operations. If that didn't work, if you didn't get an improvement by that, you could expand to two error operations, three error operations, and at some point uh, when you've done uh, these error operations enough, you might start doing some of the more powerful passing operations that are computationally expensive but that are more powerful and then you could try to apply those in some kind of hierarchy of uh, passing operations, uh, re repair operations. So, so using ever more powerful repair operations, you could eventually arrive at the correct analysis. And the you reason why... Repair what operations also don't have to be greedy. Right? Sorry? You, you could also um, use repair operations that aren't greedy. Right, right but yeah. But, but I mean, that's it basic... That's more or less the same thing. Right? That, that's more or less the same thing because when you... you Braces. The, 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 when you increase the length of the chain of repairs, elementary repair operations, yeah, you can do. You, you're basically uh, ex increasing the sort of the horizon of your repair operations, where you can. How far can you go without uh, increasing the probability? That's what you basically do. Yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is that there's an inter intermediate strategy where you say, um, suppose I make a um, rather than try to optimize the next k uh, elementary mm -hmm. moves, you could say. Uh, the moves that you consider are, are of the form make uh, make one possibly not optimal move and then three optimal moves. Yeah, but that's what the K error operation does. But actually, I mean, you wouldn't. Well, I think the K error operation looks at uh, uh, looks at say R to the K possible repairs, where R is the number of elementary operations, where there is something more limited you could do, which only looks at R possible repairs, uh, right, each then. of which says make make one. Mm -hmm. uh, Make one repair and then continue greedily. Right, but, but the intuition is that if you make it three error operation, the only reason you do that is because you didn't manage to get a local improvement by using a one error uh, uh, operation. So, so basically, when you do a, a three error operation, you'll start by making your probability worse in the first repair and the second repair, and only the third repair is going to increase the structure. Otherwise, you would have, uh, when doing this three repair, you would have after the first repair. And, and made an improvement and that if, if you did it greedily and didn't search an entire space you might actually want to say oh great I fixed the problem now so let's just say that uh, 
I'll stop at the one repair and never proceed to the three repair. And that's fine, I pr improve my probability. And then in the next passing operation, you apply the repair operations again. And if you are sort of stuck in a local min minimum, maybe in the next step you need to go to the three re repair in order to repair it. But you can, you al always use uses the shortest repair chain that you can, can in order to model it. Um, right. This probably requires more analysis and discussion than we have time left for, but I'm kind of curious how it would handle uh, phrases with double meanings, um, classic resume phrases, or letters of references from the former employer to the potential new employer about a candidate, such as, I can't possibly say enough good things about him. Uh, yeah. You'll be very lucky if you get him to work for you. Or another classic one is, I want to fix your car in the worst possible way. Right, right. So, <laughs> so there's a problem for, for right. the letters of reference. Clearly, it, it means something and, and, and you're certainly right that with this approach, which, which only looks at syntax, you cannot solve that kind of problem which really involves pragmatic reasoning. I mean, this is a basic problem we have. I mean, what we're trying to do in large parts of computational linguistics is to use simple-minded methods and see how far we can go. I think if we had the pragmatic model and the semantic model, we could feed it into the probability model and uh, sorry, maybe, uh, feed it into the probability model and, and try to try to take account of, of the probabilities produced by the pragmatic semantic model and then that would feed into the analysis. But of course if we're not taking uh, pragmatic and semantic factors into account we cannot expect to solve that kind of pro uh, phenomenon. So, so the, the dependency parse is never going to be better than the probability model. If the probability model cannot tell us what the best analysis is then we're just lost no matter what we do. Right. At the beginning of the talk, you, you talked about grammaticality. And, right. Um, and I'm just wondering, and so I recently saw Bob Berwick give a talk, um, blasting statistical parsers for exa on exactly this point that, you know, you look at some textbook examples from, from syntax textbooks, and, um, the, and then you look at the probabilities assigned to them by Collins' parser, and lo and behold, they don't differ in any sensible way, that the, the grammatical one is no more probable than the ungrammatical one. Whereas if you take a thousand word sentence, look how low a probability it has. Yeah, well, Surely it should be ungrammatical. Yes, that's point as well. So, um, so the right. claim then is that this is just, so, so, so fine, Let's, we can put that aside. But, but in any case, the question still comes back to, okay, so given this emphasis that you had at the beginning about grammaticality, um, do you have reason to believe, actually, that your parser will make distinctions between these kinds of subtle grammatical versus ungrammatical forms? So you brought up parasitic gaps. Right. Can you distinguish between a, a licensed parasitic gap versus a, a uh, you know, one where you just have an extraction of an adjunct or something? Right. I mean, this is basically an open question, but I think, I mean, my model is, there are certain things that a model is not going to do. For example, if you look at uh, Ryan McDonough's uh, parser in the non-projective case, uh, I mean, it can produce two subjects. Your Kimura's parser can, in principle, do the same thing. And my parser would certainly be able to say that you can never produce two subjects at the same, uh, at the same head. I mean, that's just possible. You cannot have a complement frame with two subjects. I mean, it's, not going, it's probably not going to detect every possible error. I mean, that would be really... Uh, well, I mean, surprising if, if it was that good. I mean, but, but I mean, the, the hope is that it would be able to detect a lot more errors than, than the other frameworks, where you don't really have, I mean, in your Kimnivers parser, you're really modeling the, uh, the, the parsing operations that you perform in this, this, uh, um, in this parsing history. So you're not really modeling the probability of, uh, of the entire analysis, but just looking at passing decisions and sequences of them based on some context. So he cannot really, I mean, maybe he can rule out double subjects. I think he has, uh, has done that by now. But I mean, that many things had, that he cannot check uh, with analysis. So, so the, but what, what's the measure of that this, I, I think I might have just lost the forest for the trees. Of, right. um, um, What's the, if we have an ungrammatical utter, an ungrammatical sentence, mm. what would it be, what would it mean to say that your parser attributes ungrammaticality to that sentence locally or globally? I mean, I think one way of looking at it is that if you have a probability model of, uh, for dependency analysis, you, I think it would be interesting to make the following test. 
try to generate sentences randomly with this probability model and then ask a human to assign grammaticality on grammaticality ratings or sort of count the errors in the analysis generated by this uh, model maybe just the syntactic ones and not the semantic ones and then count that that would be sort of a measure of generative adequacy and I think using a model like this you'd be you'd have a far larger chance of generating good sentences than you would have with say Ryan McDonald's work or, or Joachim Niebuhr's parser uh, I, because you can model these phenomena. Generated. Sorry? Those are even generated. Yes, but you could you could make uh, derivations randomly. Use the model for making random derivations, I suppose. Should, shouldn't that be possible? Yes. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I didn't pay attention, but maybe I did. Uh, are there any results here? In other words, can we say something concrete like sentences of length like twenty or less? are correctly parsed? No, no, I... I mean, uh, you assign them correct dependencies? Um, yeah. No, I, I cannot do that, that at this point because... But I, can we say anything about what the, what the frequency of discovering errors are? Uh, the frequency of discovering errors in which well, sense? Well, I mean, we can give you uh, sentences, uh, spoken sentences, and they have uh, occasional grammatical errors and, right. and some of them are not grammatically erroneous and we could give you this stuff right. and you could tell us uh, what your, uh, what your uh, precision is and what your recall is. Right. But, but I mean, but so, so far I cannot do that because I didn't implement the system. So I've, I've created the theory for the system, I've created this toy grammar uh, system, a toy system that shows that that the search strategy seems to work, at least in certain constructions. But I didn't create what would really be needed in order to do what you're saying yet. What I would really need to do would be to build the system, uh, d d including all the machine learning, including the, um, the, the passing procedures, the repair operations, uh, computing the, uh, the probabilities in the graph, uh, updating them in a very efficient manner, and so on. I would do, need to implement that, and that, that is actually what I'm, that is the project that I'm pursuing at the moment. But no, I didn't reach the point yet where I have a running system and where I can test these ideas. So, so you didn't miss an important point. I didn't get to the point yet where I can present such a system to you, but I would hope that within one, two years, I actually do have such a system. That's okay. <coughs> Okay. Thank you.